make it a habit of asking for suggestions uh, from the congregation as to lessons that I haven't preached maybe before or topics that they'd like to hear on maybe that they're confused about or just want to hear because I haven't heard them in a while and so today's lesson is one of those suggestions and so when Tammy emptied the box I had a strip of paper on it and it said we always hear about uh, qualifications or qualities of elders but we don't hear about preachers and so could you do a lesson on the qualities of a preacher and so that's why the, today's lesson is entitled so you want to be a preacher the statement though in the in the um, question is a good premise. We often hear about elders. At least we hear a lot more about elders than we do about preachers. It's not that we don't hear about preachers, but you, I ask the question, why do we hear more about elders? Well, this congregation doesn't have elders, and so it's good to keep in the forefront of our minds the, the qualities of an elder so that those who might be potential elders in the future know what they should be striving to grow in, or at least how to grow uh, in order to become an elder. But I think it's also because 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 give us a list. And we like lists. Uh, it, lists are easy to follow. And so we, since we have a list, it's very easy to go, okay, elders need to be this, 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 and this. And we, we do make the point that Christians typically should be those things too, with the exception of a few things involving marriage and children. Uh, when it comes to the qualities of an elder, we, we just like a list. And you can't go in Paul's writings or Peter's writings and say, preachers, if you want to be a preacher, you got to be this, 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 and this. Paul speaks about preachers. And we're going to talk about that a little today. But it's not in a neatly packed list. And, but when it comes to the difference between elders and preachers, the denominational world has brought those two together. That's why you have what is called the pastor system. Why is it that a lot of times preachers are called pastors? It's because of the combination between an elder and a preacher, a pastor and a preacher. A pastor is a different role than a preacher. And we know that from scriptures. In Ephesians chapter 4, in verses 11 through 16, we, there we get, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. For the equipping of the saints of the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we are no longer be that we no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effect of working, by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Now you didn't see the word preacher there. What you did see is the word evangelist there. An evangelist is someone who goes out publicly to preach the gospel. Now it might be in a community, might be in a broader context. Uh, they might go out to many different cities, spread the gospel. They might preach in a church and, and go out into the community and do that. So an evangelist is typically a preacher. But notice here that it's different than a pastor. A pastor's role is a shepherding role. 
That doesn't mean that pastors can't preach. Those, those uh, duties do overlap some. But a pastor's job or a pastor's role is above and beyond preaching the gospel. There's a shepherding role in the church. And even when it comes to teachers here, you have evangelists and you have teachers and you say, well, hold on a second. Why did Paul talk about the same thing twice? And that's because the role of an evangelist is different than a role of a teacher. Sure, it is true that both evangelists and teachers teach. But teachers are typically instructing on a more uh, close level, like as far as a, a more smaller group level, might be a, a, a private level. That's teaching, instructing. People ask questions and we discuss scripture. Whereas evangelism is going out and proclaiming the gospel to those who don't have it. They, the roles overlap. But as we're going to see, there are some qualities of a preacher that uh, a teacher may not have all of them because of the, uh, certain things that you'll see in a few moments. In, many, in all regards, though, we all are to instruct others in the ways of Christ. In 1 Peter 3, verse 15, Peter says, But sanctify the Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Not everyone's going to go out and preach the gospel. But everyone should be able to go out and tell people how you became a Christian, why you became a Christian, why you walk as a Christian today. Might not be able to expound on everything that the Bible says, or at least in depth, but we should be able to tell people, I'm a Christian, this is why you need to become a Christian, this is how you become a Christian. Invite people out uh, to worship with the saints, invite people to study the Bible. We all need to be ready to do that, but not all of us are going to be preachers. But we see that because we all need to be ready to instruct others, the preaching of the gospel is important. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verses 18 to 21, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who, uh -huh, who believe. If the gospel, if people are saved by the message preached, that necessitates there must be someone preaching it. The preacher of the gospel is who preaches the message. But because the preaching of the gospel is so important. There is also a warning in scriptures about those who do it and those who even teach the gospel. In James chapter 3, in verse 1, James says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. There's a difference between telling someone about your faith in Christ and actually instructing them in the gospel. The, the one requires a lot more knowledge about scripture. If we're going to want to talk about someone who is uh, wa wanting to learn about someone or uh, how about the church, we'll say that, I'm going to require a lot more knowledge from scripture about what God's church is, who God's church is, how it uh, is to function. If I want to learn, uh, teach about the Holy Spirit, well, that's a little bit more in-depth uh, than just sitting down and recognizing that there is a Holy Spirit. Got to learn. When Bill prepares our Bible class lessons for Sunday, I know he sits down and works hard at preparing notes 
we're, yes, we're studying from a book. But if you don't know, he has copious notes on the side. And he doesn't follow. He, he will answer the questions that Dave asks. But he also will slip in some stuff he's learned along the way. But we're warned here in James 3 that not many of you become teachers knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Now, does this mean that we are going to be judged apart from Christ? In other words, that uh, there will be a preacher's judgment, and then there will be the every other person's judgment. No, but it does mean we are held to a high standard. We know what the gospel says, and we're going to be held responsible for what we teach about it. You're not held responsible for my teachings. You're held responsible for what you do. And so I'm held to a stricter judgment because what I say can affect what you do. And so I'm responsible for what I'm teaching. And the rest of James chapter 3 is going to talk about controlling our tongue. And even James chapter 1 uh, talked about controlling our tongue. Preachers need to learn to control their tongue too. Not just on saying proper, uh, as far as controlling their tongue, that they don't lash out in anger or say rude things or anything like that. We need to control our tongue with what we say when we preach the gospel. So if there, if there is warnings to preachers, we really do need to know what the qualities of a preacher should be. So that those who desire to be preachers, and I hope there are some who do, can know what is expected of them. So let's look at some of the qualities or qualifications of a preacher. First one we have to emphasize is a preacher of the gospel is to be a man. Now, we see in today's world that women are rising up into leadership roles in religion. But what does the scripture say? First Timothy 2 and 11 and 12. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, but to be in silence. First Corinthians 14, 34 and 35. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but let, they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Those two chapters are studies in and of themselves. There, is, there are things that can be learned from them, from the context. People who want to try to come along and say, well, 1 Corinthians 14 doesn't matter today, come along and try to say, you don't follow that. A woman sings. She's not silent in church. She sings. She speaks. And so you're breaking 1 Corinthians 14 as well. So we're going to break it even further than that, as if two wrongs make a right. If it is true that women aren't allowed to sing in the congregation, if we're not doing, if we're participating in that and we shouldn't be, we need to change and do what Paul says and what God says. If anyone let him, thinks himself to be spiritual, let him acknowledge the things I write to you are the commandments of God. That's in that chapter. But reading the context of that chapter, you realize what we're talking about is leading the congregation. Tongue speakers were to keep silent if there was no one to interpret. Prophets were to keep silent if they had something and someone else was speaking. And there weren't to have a parade of prophets uh, every, uh, every assembly coming together and so that the uh, service went on for hours and hours and hours and was confusing to people and people walked away not edified. God's not the author of confusion. And so the silence here is not talking about a woman opening her mouth. It's a woman taking a leadership role in the congregation. The woman doesn't lead in singing because she doesn't take a leadership role. That's not her role. The woman doesn't publicly preach the gospel doesn't lead around the Lord's Supper. But that doesn't make a woman inferior to a man. Women are instructed to teach 
but they are instructed who they are to teach. It is not those men who are Christians. They have a role to teach their children and to teach children in general. And women teach younger women. Older women teach younger women. That's what is prescribed in Scripture. Go to Titus 2. You'll find it there. Ephesians 6 talks about children obeying your parents. You have two of them, a mother and a father. And so women do have a teaching role, but it's not a public preaching role in the church. But simply being a male doesn't qualify you to be a preacher. So it doesn't mean all, male, all females, they're excluded, and everyone who's a male, who's a Christian here, they automatically can be a preacher. That's not true either. A preacher should be one who is mature, and by that I don't necessarily mean old. What I mean is someone who is not acting like a child. And that, what, when I'm talking about preaching, I'm not just talking about standing up one Sunday and preaching a lesson. I'm talking about someone who wants to make this his calling, who wants to do this on a regular basis. We do a lot, we do try to get some of our younger people as they grow up and, and they become a little bit more mature to maybe stand up and teach uh, maybe around the Lord's table. And that's a teaching role. Maybe have a short lesson because they, 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 they've been studying and they'd like to share something. But if someone is not uh, mature enough, they shouldn't be the ones who decide who, who we just choose to hear from every week because they're not they're not they're not ready for that yet there's no age limit my dad started preaching at 22 which was awfully young my uncle didn't start preaching till he was 30 and that wasn't because he didn't want to when he was younger and unable to it was because he had another job before that I started preaching at 31, and I had another job before that. I know there were some people here who thought I was pretty young compared to uh, the preachers that uh, the congregation was used to. And I was young, and I still am. But uh, there is maturity there, maturity especially in the gospel. But a preacher also... Someone who wants to be a preacher, a man who wants to be a preacher, needs to be selfless and needs to be willing to endure hardships that are certainly going to come. I said uh, to a few of the brethren here, 2020 was hard on me. 2021 was harder. And it might, you, might, you might think, well, that's a little counterintuitive. There were a lot of hardships for me last year. May not have been the same for you, and that's fine. But there were a lot of hardships on me. I had to face some things that I had not faced ever while I was preaching here. And at some points, I'm not saying me personally, but at some points when you face those hardships, you could be tempted to say, is it still worth doing what I'm doing? Or... Do I, is it still worth doing that here rather than going someplace else? Now, I'm not saying I had those thoughts, but when you have, when you face those types of afflictions and, 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 and troubles, let's not think that those thoughts don't come into our minds. Preaching is more than just standing up here on Sunday for a half hour to 45 minutes and going about a regular week, the rest of the week. There's a lot more that goes into it than that. And when a congregation doesn't have elders, who does a lot of the work fall on? Usually the preacher. And so uh, someone who's wanting to preach has to realize that it's a job, that it's a work, and you have to be willing to do it. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5 says, Be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Anyone who wants to be an evangelist needs to recognize its work. 
and that there it is a job that needs to be fulfilled, even through afflictions. Now, unlike an elder, a preacher doesn't have to be married. It's beneficial. Trust me. As a single preacher, it'd be beneficial if I was married. But I'm not. And that's just the way it is right now. But a preacher who is married at least has someone to help encourage them every day and get them through some of the troubles that they face. Because preachers do face the same problems everyone else does. Same temptations everyone else does. We sometimes think, oh, the preacher doesn't, they don't have to deal with what I deal with. Sure I do. It just may be a little on top of that as well. So, a man, a preacher first must be a man. Second thing, pretty obvious. A preacher must know the word of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, Paul says, Preach the word, be instant in season, or be ready in season, and out of season. In order to preach the word, one has to know it. Now, when you begin preaching, that doesn't mean you have to be able to quote every scripture in the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. You don't have to do that, but when you begin preaching, you should have a pretty firm understanding about the basics. You should be able to teach the gospel uh, about the cross, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus should be able to know, all right, this is what the church is, and this is what the church is not. Should be able to know a, a, a rudimentary understanding about who God is, so that you're able to teach on topics that the congregation needs. That's when it says preach the word. We'll get to preaching the whole word a li little later. But you got to have a, 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 a beginner's understanding. I know more today about scriptures than I knew eight years ago when I started. And I hope you do too. And I hope if I live eight years from now that I could say the same thing. We all have growth that we need, but a preacher needs to have an understanding of the gospel. And we shouldn't begin preaching without that understanding because again the preacher's words carry so much weight how does oops I didn't I didn't want to go there how does one begin to know the word in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 Paul said be diligent some versions say study to present yourself approved to God a worker who does not need to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth we got to know what the scripture is saying. We got to know how to properly use it. We got to understand context is key. Not only the context of the chapter, but how does this fit into the book? How does this fit into the wider picture of scripture? We got to have an understanding of those things before we sit there and start preaching on a topic. Whenever someone is preaching, they need to ensure that they know the topic. They may not have the answers to every question that someone might have afterwards. But if I stand up here and talk about the qualities or qualifications of a preacher, I, you know, I better have studied a little bit about that in Scripture. Last week, uh, I talked about the whole armor of God. Better have an understanding, okay, what, what's that armor mean? We could have gone and dealt with a lot of the Old Testament passages that Paul was actually drawing from in Ephesians 6. But the lesson was already 45 minutes long, and adding another half hour probably wasn't prudent. But do take a look, if you have a concordance, about these different pieces of the armor, because you're going to find very similar things littered throughout the Old Testament that Paul is actually drawing from right there and perhaps that will be another study where we actually take a look at those things if we don't have an understanding of the topic that we're going to speak on pick another topic and come back continue studying come back to that topic a little later and the reason is because a lot like weeds when you when false doctrine or mis even mistaken doctrine 
is implanted, it's very hard to root out. You allow, you, 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 you see a weed and you pluck the weed out, and you, weed, you get rid of the roots of the weed, all right, that's, that's not that bad. But if you see a weed and you allow it to sit there, lo and behold, a week later, you're going to have tons of weeds. It's going to be hard to weed them out. And so that's why a preacher needs to know what the word of God says and be able to preach it. Next thing we need, a uh, preacher needs, is to be loyal to Christ. Some people preach, and Bill was touched on this in our study of Philippians earlier. Some people preach for the wrong reasons. Some people preach to please others. And that's why they pick the topics they do. They, they don't want to ruffle some feathers in the congregation. They may know that there's a problem, or we're going to steer away from that problem, hope it goes away. Uh, they want to keep their job. So they know, oh, well, I know the congregation has a problem with this, so I'm not going to preach on it, because if I do, then perhaps I won't be preaching here anymore. But Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, in verse 10, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. The, goal of a pre the role of a preacher is not just for everyone to pat the preacher on the back after the lesson. Now, hopefully, you're getting something from this lesson and the other lessons I preach. But I hope that what you're learning is things that you can take and say, you know, I may not have known that. Or, oh, I now need to correct that. I need to study more and correct that. I don't do, I don't preach just to hear compliments. I, I preach because people need to hear what the Word of God says. Christians need to hear it and non-Christians need to hear it. Being people pleasers causes pre 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 preachers to ignore sins in others. And if the congregation likes the preacher, it will cause the congregation to ignore sins in the preacher. An example we have of a preacher correcting someone else who was really important, is in Galatians chapter 2. In Galatians chapter 2, in verses 11 to 14, there we find, now when Peter had come, now when Peter had come to Antioch, I, this is Paul, withstood him to his face, because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision, and the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of the Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel the Gentiles to live as Jews? Now here you go, Peter and Paul were both preachers of the gospel, yet Paul was unafraid to stand up to Peter when Peter was wrong. Peter feared the Jews, so much so that he withdrew himself from the Gentiles. And that caused others to stumble, and it might have caused the Gentiles to think, you know, we're not really Christians. And that's not what the gospel taught. Paul openly confronted Peter for his sin. Peter repented, and because of what Paul said, this is the job of a preacher, and it's perhaps the hardest job. Because, let's just face it, the congregation is like our family. It's easy to point out sin in people you don't know. It's much harder to point out sin in people you do and you care about. Yet a preacher has to do that. It's important so that we all continue on the road to heaven. If someone desires to preach, you must be loyal to Christ above all and be able to preach no matter what. Next thing is, must be ready to preach. Everyone, of course, is to be ready to teach others about their faith. We read about that in 1 Peter 3.15 earlier. But we've been discussing in our Philippians class that Bill is teaching, that Paul, even in jail, was ready to preach. 
He was in Rome, and he was teaching those who were his guards. And those guards were talking. And he was teaching those who were not his guards, who would come. Remember, at the end of Acts says, he was in a house, and people came to him and hear, hear the gospel. Paul was ready to preach even in jail. Paul also said in Romans chapter 1, in verse, in verse 15, So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. He had never met, by all accounts, he had never met the Romans yet. He might have met some people who were in Rome. But from all accounts, the first time Paul went to Rome was when he went, when he went in jail. Follow his journey through Acts. He doesn't get there. He's in Greece and Turkey a lot, but never in Rome until the end. And yet Paul wrote to the Romans. And he says, I'm ready to come and preach to you. We must always be ready as preachers because we don't know when those opportunities are going to come. It's not just Sunday. You might, you might strike up a conversation with someone or a group of people on a Tuesday afternoon when you went to the grocery store or when you went to the hardware store or when you were walking down past your neighbor's house. But as I said earlier, a preacher must be ready not only to preach the gospel, but be ready to preach the whole gospel as Paul said in Acts 20, verse 27. There are controversial parts to the gospel, not because God is being controversial, because the world doesn't want to follow it. When it comes to marriage, divorce, and remarriage, that's controversial today. What do you mean I just can't divorce my spouse and marry another? Got to be able to teach that. What do you mean there's one true church and I can't just go wherever I feel like it or whichever church I like the most? Got to be able to teach that must be taught. There are difficult parts of Scripture. The nature of God is something that we constantly struggle with because God is infinite and we are not. Our minds can only grasp so much. And even what we know about God, there's still much more to know. That's hard. The relationship between the Old and New Testament, I don't know, I don't know how our podcast, I guess because we're in Deuteronomy, we've been getting a lot of comments about people who think that we still have to follow the Old Testament today. Why is that? Because it is a difficult topic to realize that the New Covenant is what we are under because many preachers are preaching that we're still under the Old as well, or at least parts of the Old got to understand those things. Those are difficult. And of course, then there are some things that just be plain unpopular, especially when it comes to morals. What do you mean I can't just uh, uh, be sexually promiscuous? What do, you, what do you mean I have to control my tongue? What do you mean I have to uh, act a certain way and give up some things? Preacher must learn to preach it all. Preacher must be ready to preach. Moving on, a preacher must also be humble. The role of a preacher and the goal of a preacher is to draw people to Christ, not themselves. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, Paul said, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That's the goal that Paul had, to present the Corinthians whom he was preaching to to Christ. The goal of preaching is thus not simply to win arguments, but to show others the truth. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. All of this requires humility because as a preacher, I could be wrong. I'm not infallible. I can make mistakes. Bill can too. And so can anyone else who stands up here. Because we are human. No matter how much we study, 
No matter how much we think we know the scriptures, we can still be wrong. We try not to, but we can still be wrong. It takes humility to recognize that. Peter was wrong, and Paul needed to correct him. Peter, when he knew he was wrong, he repented. If a man cannot admit wrong and change when he is wrong, he is not fit to preach the gospel. And then finally, when it comes to qualities of the preacher, the preacher must not hinder the gospel. Preachers are by the nature of the job that they do more in the public eye than anyone else in the congregation. You can look my name up on Google and you will find not only the sermons I preach here, but you'll find the sermons I've preached other places. Of course, you'll find our podcasts. You'll find a lot of stuff about my name. If I look up your names, chances are, uh, unless you've done something that's going to get you on the internet, not going to find as much. And if I do, maybe it's not for uh, related to the church. It might be related to a job you have or something you've written. But because I'm more in the public eye, this means that people, not only the congregation, but others, are examining the preacher's words, the preacher's actions. You know how many times on YouTube that I've been called a false preacher? Not because they say anything. You, you can put a comment on YouTube on any video, and usually I find I'm sitting there going, that has nothing to do with the video you commented on. It just... You were a troll out there wanting to put a comment on a video. If, I, if I'm a false preacher, tell me why. Please tell me why. Because I don't want to be a false preacher. But usually, on YouTube especially, it's just people trolling around looking to start a fight. But they're examining the words and actions. People are examining. Thus, preachers should behave in a way so that they do not become a hindrance to someone obeying the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 9, and verse 12, Paul said, If others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? Nevertheless, we have not used this right, but endure all things, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. That's talking about being paid by the Corinthians. Paul didn't want to hinder the gospel of Christ, so he didn't take a wage from them. He thought that was going to be a hindrance. He said, I have the right to do that, but I'm not going to hinder the gospel, so I won't. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 3, We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. We aren't, the preacher isn't to be the focus. The gospel is. So preachers, yes, you might be slandered publicly, but we're not to give people a reason to do so. Okay? Thus, if we are slandered, we are slandered falsely. And that may happen. But we should try to preach the gospel purely, preach the gospel correctly, and not be a hindrance to it. So all these, now there can be more, but these six are the ones I chose to focus on today. You'll notice, though, but there are some things that aren't on that list. First thing is an eloquent speaker or an excellent speaker. We all know the verse from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. There's nothing wrong with eloquence. Some people are better speakers than me. Some people are not. It doesn't matter. What matters is, remember, the preacher's not trying to win people to himself, trying to win people to Christ. I'd much rather be known as a preacher who preaches the word plainly in a way that can be understood by everyone than one who is good at crafting words together in order to sound like a professional speaker. There are those who can do both of those things. And there are others who can't. The gospel is what's important. The message preached. And we should all be 
examining the message, not simply the messenger. Something else that wasn't on my list was formally educated. Denominations have their seminaries. They have their schools and training programs. And unfortunately, even in the Lord's Church, there are some who think, who are beginning to think that, you know, it really is a needs to be a requirement of preachers that they have an understanding of Hebrew, have an understanding of Koine Greek, so that they understand a little bit more about what the scriptures are saying. And the thing I tell people is this. If I can't understand in the language I speak the gospel, there's a problem with the translation. Because the people who translate it are using the same types of manuscripts that we have. Some translations are better than others because they use the new, maybe some older manuscripts that we knew we didn't have before. But if we have more translations of the Bible today than at any other point in history, we can understand the Bible in our language today, and if we can't, it's because we're not reading it. I do not have to be a Hebrew scholar or a Greek scholar in order to know what God says. How do I know that? Look at who preached it in the first century. In Acts chapter 4, in verse 13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. These men were fishermen. Were they Hebrew scholars and Greek scholars? No, they spoke Hebrew or Aramaic. I don't know if Peter spoke Greek at this point, yeah, the books of First and Second Peter were written in Greek, but it is possible that they were translated by someone who spoke it. That is quite possible. But they were uneducated. They didn't go to the Pharisees' rabbinical schools or the Sadducees' training. Uh, they didn't do those things. They had been with Jesus. That's how they knew what these men were speaking, because it sounded a lot like Jesus. They'd been with Jesus for three years. Now, Paul hadn't been with Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 5 and 6, For I must consider that I am not at all inferior to the most eminent of apostles, even though I am untrained in speech, yet I am not in knowledge. But we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things. Paul fulfilled all those other uh, qualities of a preacher. He knew what the word of God said, he could speak it plainly. He said, I wasn't well trained in speech. Again, we, we figure Paul's not an eloquent man, probably, or at least not as eloquent as others. But he knew what the gospel said, and he was able to preach it effectively. There's nothing wrong, per se, in training <laughs> preachers. In fact, especially as uh, younger people, it's good for us to sit down and teach them how to preach, because it is not just uh, sitting there and standing up here and automatically thinking about a sermon and being able to preach it. It's good for them to learn how to do that. But, because Jesus did that with the apostles, Paul did that with Timothy, but you don't need a degree in order to be a preacher. You just don't need to. I don't have one. In fact, sometimes people make a point of that. Well, he doesn't have this degree or that degree. I'm not talking about this congregation. As somehow that's a bad thing. They say the same thing about Peter and John. And yet, those were apostles of Jesus. And the final thing is, the preacher doesn't have to be popular. This seems to be a qualification, at least if someone wants to preach in a larger congregation or preach many gospel meetings. You, you know if someone is a popular speaker, if they get called to many gospel meetings. We try to have people at this congregation who don't always get to preach in gospel meetings. Because it gives them an opportunity, A, to go out and see other churches besides the one they preach in. But B, we want to hear different voices. 
Now, from time to time, we do get a preacher that we, we know very good and, and, and one who goes out on a lot of gospel meetings, but it's not a qualification of a preacher. Were any of the apostles popular? Think of Paul. Is he popular? No, he was beaten and stoned and, and um, thrown in jail. Was Jesus popular? No, in fact, by popular opinion, Matthew 27, 20 to 23 says he was crucified. That's how popular he was. So if the master teacher himself, the one who is the best teacher of all, wasn't popular and that was okay, who am I to think any different? In conclusion, a preacher of the word of God must be able to teach the gospel correctly in its entirety, in good times and in bad, in humility and without distracting from it. One will be an effective gospel preacher if he does these things, even if he doesn't meet the world's standards. One who is able, not able to do these things should not preach until he is able to do them. Because James 3 verse 1 gives us that warning. Well, becoming a preacher is not a requirement in order to become a Christian. Women are not preachers, yet all women are called to become Christians. Not all men will become preachers, yet all men are called to become Christians. How do we do that? We need to believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ and repent of our sins confess our faith, and be ready to be baptized for the remission of our sins. If we are ready to do that, do tell. Do tell one of the men here, one of the women here, you know, I'm ready to be baptized. Do so after the service. We'll take you to a place of baptism even here today. Become a Christian today because we don't know what tomorrow will bring. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to defend.